Excellent. So without further ado, I'll go into the introduction on the session uh, from colleagues at um, uh, VU Amsterdam uh, University Library. Um, they clearly are facing the same sort of challenges that we all are in regards to equity, diversity and inclusion, um, the decolonization, decolonization issues that we face in terms of our collections. And in this presentation, uh, Dr. Michelle Meyer and Esther Nieland will draw on the experiences from the working group they have established on decolonization and collections and highlight the, the recent research they've um, uh, been undertaking in regards to practical interventions into collections acquisitions, descriptions and presentation processes and also um, looking at the way in which they are seeking sustainable collaborations with students and staff, as well as colleagues from other libraries, and helping spread awareness about decolonization and supporting diversity and, and decolonization initiatives within their, within their own institution. Uh, so um, I think you've heard enough from me, so I'm going to hand you over to our, our speakers today, and um, then we'll be taking questions, obviously, through the, the button. So over to our colleagues in Amsterdam. Just take the liberty to now say that I have a bit of a cold, so if I'm starting to cough uh, real badly, uh, my colleague Michelle will take over from me. But uh, hopefully everything goes well. Um, so my name is Esther Nijland, and uh, this is my colleague Michelle Meyer. Uh, before we start, uh, we would like to point out that we stand here on behalf of our library's working group, Decolonization and Collections. We started this group in early 2023. Initially, our goal was to ensure that harmful or offensive subject headings were no longer visible in our library catalog and to provide respectful alternatives. Soon, we decided to broaden the scope of the working group and to investigate how we can make our library more inclusive by not only looking at the ways we describe, but also acquire and present our collections. Let's uh, start with some questions. How can libraries effectively contribute to decolonization? What domains should we focus on? And what actions can we undertake? In this presentation, we will draw from the experience of our working group to underline recent researchers important conclusions that despite being rooted in colonialism, libraries can contribute to the decolonization process in the following ways, through practical interventions in their own collections within these three domains, acquisition, description, and presentation, by sharing knowledge and seeking collaborations with national and international colleagues, and by supporting decolonization initiatives within our own universities. We will discuss the following, uh, what we mean by decolonizing academic libraries and why we have chosen to use the term decolonization, at least for now. Examples of practical interventions we have undertaken and want to undertake at the Vue Library, the challenges uh, we have encountered so far, and last, uh, examples of seeking collaborations and supporting decolonization initiatives which we believe will help to overcome these challenges. And in the end, uh, we're looking forward to uh, have a discussion. Uh, we have some uh, time left. So to add a bit of context uh, to the examples that will follow, let me tell you a little bit about VU Amsterdam. VU stands for Vrije Universiteit or Free University a university independent of the influences of state and church. Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam was founded in 1880 as a Protestant university. Initially, only theology, law, and the arts were taught and only Protestant students were admitted. But by the end of the 70s, the VU became broadly oriented public university it is today where all students are welcome. In fact, VU now has one of the most culturally diverse student populations in the Netherlands. As for the library, we have a multidisciplinary collection that really started growing from the 70s onwards and now comprises 33 kilometers of books, complemented by our online materials. On top of that, we have a special collections department. 
only part of our collections uh, is openly accessible in our study rooms. Yes, um, so now we'd like to start with explaining how our working group understands uh, decolonization in the context of academic libraries. Um, perhaps this uh, definition is not new to you all, but we still wanted to briefly talk about it to um, explain at least uh, what, where we set out from uh, as working group. And what really helped us in our thinking process was this publication by um, Crilly and Everett um, of 2022. As Crilly and Everett explain, decolonization means being aware that Western libraries are part of an academic knowledge system deeply rooted in colonialism. And in this system, European knowledge and its creators have always been regarded as superior or more valuable. And this uh, greatly influenced the way we collect, describe, and present our materials. The colonial past therefore still impacts all our university libraries, even those without direct ties to the colonial past, such as libraries of younger universities. Crilly and Everett also explain that libraries are starting to realize that decolonization work entails more than only diversity. It is not merely adding marginalized voices to our collection and neither is decolonization about erasing colonial descriptions or colonial books. Rather, it is about understanding um, where the biases in our collections come from uh, critically assessing our roles as librarians and fundamentally trying to change our daily operations. So the way we acquire, describe and present our collections so that all students and staff feel represented and at home. But there has also been critique on decolonization projects at universities and academic libraries. And this quote from the same book um, summarizes it well. There is a quandary at the heart of the call to decolonize. If the neoliberal university is part of the problem and systematically racist, is decolonization a philosophical possibility? And by association, can libraries decolonize within those structures and constraints? Or is coloniality so embedded as to be immutable, who has the insight and the wisdom to do this? So, for instance, we can say that we are not truly decolonizing if we keep spending the largest part of our collection budgets on the so-called big deals, or if we keep making use of the so-called universal Western classification systems. So, can libraries then still contribute to decolonization? For an answer, we stay with this book of Crilly and Everett. In their introduction, they are clear that while this critique is valid, libraries can and are working to decolonize, um, first of all, by means of practical interventions. In combination with collaboration with staff and students, influence with publishers and suppliers and developing a critical understanding of the biases in their collections. In line with this argument, we chose to continue using the term decolonization with full awareness of these complexities and under specific conditions. So besides working towards inclusive uh, collections within these three domains um, so that all staff and students feel at home and represented in our library, we should continue that we should continuously recognize the role of the library in perpetuating colonial narratives and practices and their lasting impacts on communities and use the library to influence broader institutional change, not only by supporting decolonization in initiatives, but also uh, trying to proactively start the conversation 
with students and staff. And more on that later, but for now, let's um, concentrate on the practical interventions. Um, in a recent literature review, again by Jess Billy, um, a literature review on diversity and decolonization work in academic libraries, um, she has pointed out that such practices have developed over the three areas we've also decided to focus on in our working group. So these are acquisition. So think about collection development and for example, the support of the diversification of reading lists, description such as addressing outdated and offensive terminology and the presentation. So making sure open collections reflect local communities of the university. We will now for each of these three domains give examples of practical interventions from our uh, university library. And we want to stress that we um, are aware that these are only first steps and that there is still a long way to go. First, acquisition. Like many libraries, at FU we face the challenge that most of our budget goes to big deals or the read and publish deals. As a result, um, a significant portion of our uh, content comes from large, uh, mostly UK and US publishers, which leads to a bias in our collection towards English language publications and high impact journals, often excluding regionally specific research from the global south. This in turn doesn't leave much budget for individual purchase, purchases, which um, in turn um, reinforces the Eurocentric bias in our collection. And then there is um, the issue that, of course, diversification of our collections must be done in consul consultation with uh, the faculties, which is impossible to do overnight. We have to say that we, for now, only made little progress in this area. We had initial discussions with a few professors and faculty library committees in the humanities and theology and religion faculties um, about diversifying educational materials. And we uh, want to focus the, on this in the coming year. And we are also looking to hear from other libraries how they go about diversifying their collections and whether they are able to uh, reflect on and adjust acquisition policies within their libraries. So for instance, we were very lucky to have a conversation with uh, Ross Evans and Kate Cheney from the UCL Working Group Liberating the Collections on how they incorporated DEI into their acquisition policy. <coughs> and now Esther will take over if you are doing okay. Yes. Um, so, like many libraries, during cataloging, we have used a thesauri that contain outdated keywords. In the last few years, uh, we had become more aware that many subject headings in our bibliographical records were outdated and in more than a few instances, outright harmful or offensive. Uh, for two examples, a uh, Hottentot is a derogatory Dutch colonial name for the Khoisan people. Indigenous peoples from Southern Africa who traditionally speak non-Bantu languages. The Dutch term Polychinele Axis has been replaced by the term Nederlands Indonesische Oorlogen, uh, Dutch Indonesian Wars. The term Polychinele Axis refers to the extensive military operations by the Dutch army from 1945 to 1949 to stop Indonesia from gaining independence. The Dutch government insisted it wasn't a war, but a legitimate way to suppress a rebellion, calling it Polychinele Axis. Many, including the descendants of victims, find this term misleading. The use of euphemistic language hides the actual violence and harm caused and, diminished, uh, and diminishes the victims to mere rebels. As explained in the Words Matter publication, while there is no consensus on alternative terms, in the Netherlands, the more historically correct term Dutch Indonesian wars had been suggested, uh, which we therefore have chosen as alternative. 
um, many thesauri are not being updated anymore or are updated very slowly, which is why we decided to make adjustments of our own. For the longer these offensive terms would be visible, the longer we would be doing a disservice to our diverse student population. So how did we do this? Fortunately, OCLC, the provider of our integrated library system, announced in 2022 that they had created a local subject heading remapping template. In this remapping template, you are able to make a list of outdated or harmful, term, um, or harmful subject headings and a list of alternatives you would like to display in your online catalog or discovery system instead. The OCLC template already provided a list of outdated English terms and alternatives. So we decided uh, to focus only on Dutch subject headings. One of the reasons is that until 2016, uh, language of cataloging was Dutch. This means we have many legacy records that have been cataloged in Dutch, and therefore the majority of the outdated subject headings are in Dutch. Also, we prefer to leave subject headings in other languages to the native speakers of those languages. To be clear, this template does not remove or transform the original bibliographical metadata. Rather, one should view the template more like a translation tool. Instead of showing the original harmful subject headings, our discovery system shows a more respectful alternative. It also has zero effect on the search results. In this example, uh, I've searched for books with the outdated term Zigeuners uh, in English, that would be gypsies. This is one of the results, and as you can see in the bibliographical metadata, we don't see the derogatory subject heading um, Zigeuners, but the more respectful alternative Roma and Sinti. When you open the bibliographical record, you'll see a longer list of subject headings in several languages, uh, discovery still shows the Dutch alternative term. But if you click on the subject heading, a, a text will pop up with an explanation of what we have done with the original term. So where do you start? Uh, how do you know which terms are harmful or outdated? How do you find them among tens of thousands of subject headings? And how do you then find the preferred alternatives? We were fortunate to be uh, able to uh, lean on two great sources. The first one, uh, which I mentioned just before, is the publication Words Matter of World Museum Amsterdam, which is an extensive glossary of outdated or offensive terms and suggestions for more respectful alternatives. Our second source is the online glossary for inclusive language by the VRT, the National Public Service Broadcaster for the Flemish community of Belgium. The website provides an extensive list of terms and suggestions for respectful alternatives. They even divided their list in categories, which was very helpful. These categories are not only centered around colonialism, but comprise a wider spectrum of marginalized groups. And therefore we decided to not only update subject headings connected to colonialism and racism, but also those having to do with ableism, ageism, homophobia, etc. Armed with more knowledge, thanks to our sources, we proceeded as follows. First, uh, we extracted all local uh, subject headings in Dutch. We then check them against our sources to identify all the subject headings uh, we needed to uh, add to our template. And our last step was to find more respectful alternatives to replace them with. So how do you find these respectful alternatives? We kept the following considerations in mind. We will focus on the person first not make one aspect their whole identity. For example, uh, persons who are blind instead of just the blind. We will stay away from using outdated language. Uh, so for example, 
uh, Roma and Sinti instead of, instead of gypsies. And we listen to the people belonging to the group about how they would prefer being called or what they call themselves, thereby consulting the most recent sources available to us. We're also in contact with a PhD student with an amazing network who offered to help us organize an expert meeting to review the adjustments we made so far and reveal potential terms or categories you may have overlooked. We are well aware we might have missed outdated terms during this process. And of course, language changes all the time. Therefore, we view this as a continuous process. That is why we show a statement on the main discovery page, uh, warning users, they may come across outdated terms. We also invite them to let us know when and where they do so, so we can update our catalog and the template. The statement also refers to our website where we have included our full statement on decolonization, explain our activities and how we went about replacing the subject headings including an example of a replaced subject heading. Michelle will take over again to illustrate the last domain and to discuss the challenges we found along the way and how to overcome them. Indeed, so the third domain, um, presentation of open collections. Um, so as already, uh, as Esther already explained in the beginning, only part of our um, collections are uh, openly accessible in our study rooms. Um, but these are primarily uh, very wide Eurocentric collections, such as um, the art history collection here uh, on the slide. So right now we can say that our open collections do not represent our diverse student body at all. And this is highly problematic because what does a collection like, for example, this one um, with chiefly white authors say to students about what academic research is and who may participate in academia? So that's the first problem. And this has been shown by research that such white collections can give students of color a feeling of exclusion and not belonging. Secondly, uh, some of these collections, in fact, also uh, no longer reflect the current more diverse education and research that's being carried out, that's being carried out at uh, FU. Um, additionally, we have several problematic local uh, classification systems um, for example, uh, the classification for religion and theology. So those are the books from my collection. And when I purchase a new uh, print book, I have two options. Um, I can put it under CK, Christian theology, or CC, which is the rest. So that means all the other religions, um, but also books for religious studies. Um, so um, again, uh, a review of uh, the content and also of the classification of the open collections must be, do must be done in consultation with the faculties. So this is also something that um, uh, is um, not done overnight. And um, we have started conversations um, with the faculty about this but there is still a long way to go. And this is also something we want to focus on in the coming months. Um, not being able, as I said, to diversify our open collections overnight, we have curated theme collections with the help of students and staff. And this is one example. This was a collection on um, the history of slavery and its aftermath on the occasion of the Dutch Slavery Memorial Year. Uh, curated by uh, researchers from the VU library, uh, from the VU, uh, who are uh, specialized in the history of slavery. In the final part of the presentation, we'd like to go into the challenges uh, we uh, have encountered so far. I, we already uh, discussed some of them, um, as well as, um, and these challenges are not only uh, encountered by us, but um, 
um, in the past couple of uh, months, um, we have, of course, talked with uh, many other colleagues, um, especially in the Netherlands, and we see that they encounter the same um, problems. Um, the first problem, uh, these are only a couple of examples, um, the list is long. Um, first one is, of course, the lack of expertise among uh, library staff. So, for example, when it comes to adjusting keywords in other systems than OCLC. So OCLC has this beautiful um, remapping tool, uh, Esther talked about, but what if you make use of other systems? How then can you make sure that you um, make the adjustments, adjustments uh, while uh, not changing the actual meta metadata? Um, then, of course, we... Oh, might also ask how uh, shouldn't we move away entirely from Western classification systems and how can we find a good alternative? And also how can we influence major publishers and suppliers to include non-mainstream literature? So we see there is a great need for knowledge exchange and also collaboration uh, to take on these uh, major issues. Um, and then there's the important question how we can respectfully involve students and staff in decolonization work while acknowledging the emotional labor this work can entail, especially for staff and students of color. So here there is the need for um, building sustainable relationships with students and staff based on recipro reciprocity. At the beginning of the presentation, we mentioned two other ways to contribute to decolonization besides practical interventions. So sharing knowledge and seeking collaborations with uh, national and international colleagues and by supporting decolonization initiatives. We will end the presentation with two concrete examples of these activities, which uh, we think um, can contribute to overcoming uh, the aforementioned challenges. First, an example of seeking collaborations. Um, then we should tell a little bit about the Dutch context. So there are only uh, some, there have only been some small Dutch um, in it, uh, student initiatives um, at Dutch universities, but no uh, large campaigns such as, for example, um, um, the, the Why is my curriculum so white uh, campaign. More work has been done in, Dutch, in the Dutch museum sector, especially on inclusive descriptions. So that's also uh, where the, the words matter publication uh, comes from. Um, and of course, about the research and uh, return of objects of colonial heritage. And um, also some more work is being done at the special collections departments of Dutch universities. And this is made, um, uh, um, and um, we also see, have um, seen the publication um, verzameld in naam van de wetenschap, so collected in the name of science, which is an advice of the foundation of academic heritage about uh, how to deal with academic collections from a colonial context. Um, but for the rest, um, um, we see many colleagues um, like us who want to uh, do something, but um, in terms of the, the more modern collections, um, but don't know where to start. So um, therefore we initiated a national collaboration, decolonization and collections. Um, it's going to be, uh, so we are in the process of setting it up. Um, will be uh, hopefully a national working group um, under the, yeah, the Dutch uh, Research Libraries UK, so the UKB. Um, and our goals are uh, the exchange of knowledge and expertise, working together on these practical interventions, and also very importantly, working towards a national statement. Um, yesterday, uh, actually, we had our second meeting in which we discussed our goals and mm -hmm. the first... <laughs> And the first concrete steps, um, for instance, the formation of a specific task force that will uh, work on a guide to help libraries to make their metadata more inclusive. And we really hope that this collaboration will put um, decolonization on the agenda of all Dutch libraries 
and give more librarians the opportunity to start or to accelerate um, the decolonization work at their uh, university. Then an example of supporting decolonization initiatives. Um, at, in our library, we have the Food Diversity Office's Decolonization Lab. This is a physical space in the library where students and staff can come to learn about colonialism and decolonization, especially at universities. Um, the library has been involved from the beginning um, with uh, a representation from uh, our uh, working group and also the curator of academic heritage. And together with uh, the former decolonization officer and staff and students, we have curated a book the book collection on, the, on colonial history from global and Dutch perspectives. And the curator has made a mini uh, exhibition of objects from the academic heritage collection that tell something about the colonial history of the food. So the, the team of the decolonization lab uh, consists of uh, people from the diversity office, uh, as I said, our working group and the curator, but also events manager from um, the library to help with organizing activities, someone from the food communication department, and also very importantly, the board of the student association FAM, which stands for Family of Academic Minds. And uh, this is a student association for students of diverse backgrounds uh, of the FU. Um, and um, they are uh, also able to, um, they are allowed to use this room for their meetings and uh, activities. It has been very valuable for the library to and our working group to be part of this team. Um, by uh, being part of this team, we can organize um, uh, uh, together. Um, uh, uh, so, um, sorry. Um, so by being part of this team, we um, can, uh, uh, we um, were very, uh, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, so, um, First of all, um, we can uh, help the students of them to organize activities, but also organize activities together. Um, so for example, we are um, organizing a couple of workshops around the uh, opening of the decolonization lab, which will have an official opening in uh, January. Uh, so for example, we are thinking about a workshop in which uh, students can um, have a discussion about what decolonization of the university means for them. Um, it was also really nice that these students could um, uh, can give us um, um, very uh, nice um, uh, um, book suggestions um, for books to enrich the collection. Um, and in general, the team functions as a focus or a consultation group in which we provide each other feedback on related activities or projects. So for instance, the um, uh, decolonization officer uh, helped us with choosing alternatives for some of the outdated terms. And most importantly, we learned that many students or, uh, already uh, know quite a lot about colonial history and that decolonization of the university is a real issue for them. And being part of this team uh, forces us to connect with the few community and remind us um, continuously why we need to decolonize. And it keeps us from getting lost in these practical interventions, which are necessary, but are only part of the, of the picture of the story. So in the coming months, we want to focus on formalizing the National Decolonization and Collections Collaboration. Um, we want to look at the uh, reclassification of these problematic uh, local classification system and continue uh, the dialogue with teachers about uh, specifically uh, decolonizing teaching material. We hope to have conveyed that Decolonization is a mindset and should be an integral part 
of our daily work and that there are big and small actions we can undertake at our own libraries that can have meaningful impact. And we also hope to have shown that collaboration is crucial to go beyond our individual efforts. We need to exchange knowledge and expertise to avoid, to avoid reinventing the wheel and wasting precious time and efforts. We need to raise awareness together and discuss within the library community how to fundamentally change the way we work. We are very um, grateful for your attention and for the invitation, and we look forward to your questions or remarks. Well, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Michelle and Esther. That's a that's a fantastic gallop through of all the work you've been doing. Um, so. Um, I was primed before this call to say if there aren't any questions, I was going to take Chair's prerogative to ask questions, but I'm pleased to say there are plenty in the queue. So I'm going to start from the top from uh, yeah, Kelly Misa. Yeah, yeah. So the first question is, um, um, are you able to record in your thesaurus the time span during which terms were actively used? So this is this is presumably almost like a chronology in terms of things which are in common parlance. Um, no, we haven't been able to do that. Um, sorry. Oh. <coughs> Bless you. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, no, that would be very interesting, but um, uh, since the thesaurus um, was used over a pretty um, long span of time, um, it's hard to pinpoint from when to when uh, terms were used. Uh, but we can... Um, I think from the 70s, maybe um, until now, actually, because these old, the Dutch Tissori um, are not really being updated, also because uh, most of the university libraries are now um, cataloging in English and not in Dutch anymore. So we don't add uh, Dutch subject headings. Yeah. So they're. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more like it sounds, it sounds like an opportunity for a, a linguistic department to be involved in that type of uh, research. So, <laughs> OK, uh, the next question from Cliff um, in changing out of date words, many are still used in society by the majority, e.g. blind. If users still search using these out of date terms, will they be able to find the resources? I will the system still search for, quote, blind, end quote. Now, I think you, you've referenced that already, but do you want to talk to that point? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, you can search on the old terms. They will pop up in your search results. Also, if you search on the, the, the alternative terms, it's just that we won't uh, show the original uh, subject, headings, subject headings in the bibliographical metadata, which will show on the online catalog. That's great. OK, uh, Karen Mercer again ask a question. Uh, do you include the Wikidata reference forward slash number in the record of your thesaurus term? So this is. Oh. Um, no, <laughs> no. OK, I, I don't. Um, I'm not really sure if I understand the question correctly. Uh, perhaps we can ask Karamisa to perhaps clarify that in the in the in the chat as we go forward because we've still got fifteen minutes to go. So, should we move on to the next question uh, from um, Ardad? And it says, uh, "Thank you for your presentation. Have you expanded your redescription work beyond subject headings?" Question mark. Do you know the extent of harmful metadata in other fields? And have you developed guidance for those fields? So this is beyond the subject headings. Well, we not yet is think I think now um, That's the a best short answer. answer. <laughs> yeah. So well, um, it happens that tomorrow we will have a, a national meeting on uh, metadata in the for libraries and uh, heritage uh, institutions, um, and yeah, we are aware of the the bigger. Uh, from, well, how do I say that? Um, it, it's not only a subject headings, it's also in descriptions, and that is a, another um, big problem, but uh, it also has to be tackled differently. Um, we, but we're still um, the, um, 
trying to yeah get a sort of um, um, plan to how to approach the, the problem. Yeah, well, yeah, we're not really. Um, and I think that for our own sure. um, um, uh, the own our own records. So for example, and so we as we said we work with OCLC and so WorldCat. So you have the subject headings, but also always the the description. Um, and we found out that we can't change this ourselves, uh, or sometimes we can't uh, because it's um, it says that it's been um, so the name of the how to say I want to uh, oh talk about right the, so sometimes metadata is provided by other uh, um, institutions institute? yeah. sort of but uh, yeah we just take over the metadata and um, yeah we don't uh, adjust. So it would be better to reach out to that institute and explain like why we think this description. Should yeah, be this is this is where you, you've got a shared service community of practice, and uh, obviously yeah. records are being created globally. Uh, so that in itself can present issues. Um, so it's both with OCLC and other vendors, um, uh, such as Clarivate. So, but uh, you did touch on the point about uh, classification schemas as well, and the way in which some of those classification schemes are impacting the user experience so so we're going to go on to the next question uh from um uh well anonymous attendee so that's an interesting name uh so we um, we have found this uh decolonization process of our online catalog to be very time consuming and needing constant updating how many people do you have working on this in the library do you have someone specifically assigned to this this particular role uh, we wish, yeah. but it's just uh, our four in the working group, um, and we, yeah, it's uh, extra work on top of our normal work, actually, yeah. so. Yeah. So yeah. They, they, there are four in the metadata team, or well, four actually, in total? I'm, it's you. <laughs> it's me. Right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the metadata specialist. A, a team of one, no, that's that. One, yeah. That's yes. fine. So you're you, so in terms of your percentage of time, how much time would you spend on this particular endeavor? What do you think about? Well, it goes in waves. So um, sometimes, uh, yeah, it'll be uh, a couple, couple of, of hours or days in a yeah in a month or more, but it's just um, short. Highly frustrated hours, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. We're lucky in that regard that um, our um, um, managers and also the director of our library is very uh, finds it very important work. So we get hours, but at the same time, of course, our normal work is still uh, still there. So yeah. we get the support, um, but still, it's sometimes hard hard, of course. But um, yeah. Yeah, so managing. Yeah, that's great. So the next question is, uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you started to build relationships with students and staff to get them involved uh, with the projects? And uh, have there been any challenges with that particular process? Mm. Yeah, so um, <coughs> for the decolonization lab, it was um, this went very organically. Um, because the, um, the team was set up by the diversity office and especially uh, Danny Surkarnsing, the, the former decolonization officer, who unfortunately is not working here anymore, but he had a very uh, large network and he was also one of the founders of the Student Association FAM. So that was very um, easy, but, um, and, and there are no um, challenges in that way because the, the students also have um, time to do this uh, work in the board. So this being part of the decolonization lab is um, part of their um, yeah, work as a, as a board member. So that's that works very well. Um, but for the faculties, it's um, more difficult. We have had some um, teachers who are, who are um, coming to us, for example, um, um, some teachers from philosophy who are um, working to um, diversify their reading list and also in general world philosophies is uh, becoming more important at the food so that came very came very naturally but um, 
yeah, we also, in talking with uh, other subject librarians, uh, see that, um, yeah, at other faculties, it's uh, not really um, uh, a topic yet, uh, yet. So we are now thinking about how we can proactively start this conversation. And um, there's also the issue of, yeah, um, uh, we first have to speak among ourselves, among the subject librarians, to make sure that everyone uh, you know, wants to invest their, t their time in this because we are working on this, um, yeah, for at least uh, several hours a week. So we are very, um, we still have a lot to learn, but we um, made a start already. So for us, it's more easier to go into the faculties and start this conversation. But for other librarians who have not yet done that, um, it's more difficult. So we also should um, start with our colleagues first. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's a bit of sort of knowledge transfer and skills development and building that sort of narrative and building confidence, I presume, in yeah, yeah, those sort of yeah. conversations, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. that's great. But the next next question um, is, um, you mentioned uh, asking people themselves, can you please expand on how you went about this? For example, did you ask people outside of the university, question mark? Um, how did you identify the best people to ask? And uh, did you find that you needed the, a number of responses to determine whether a new term was generally the term currently in use and not reflecting current individual bias? So there's a bit of a three-parter question there. <laughs> so. Well, we are still um, looking to have an, uh, a closer review of our um, uh, the terms we, we found uh, so far. Uh, we mostly consulted uh, written sources so the both source the two sources i mentioned plus uh, a lot of um, uh, helpful articles uh, concerning the topics also uh, probably by those uh, uh, be, who are part of the group um, but we uh, as i mentioned um, uh, there we are planning on um, creating a uh, sort of an expert um, an team, expert meeting, yeah. an expert meeting with people from from all those uh, marginalized yeah, groups, uh, for lack of a better uh, description, to actively uh, go through all the, the terms and then, yeah, for feedback and yeah. just... I think one part of the question was really about public engagement uh, when it said outside of the university. So presumably that could be other other groups um is it just being contained within the university for now yes so this yeah. a researcher who we've been in contact with and who offered to help us with organizing this uh expert meeting because she has a really amazing um a network um she is a researcher at the at the at the, the faculty of humanities here um so that's also why she contacted us because she she saw the news um yeah. Uh, about uh, the the website we uh, made, um, so I think that is more something for the future, and that for now we are really focusing on steps we can take. So that's also why we decided to um, already um, make these adjustments um, based on written sources because um, organizing an expert meeting. Um, takes time because we want to do it well and we want to think about how we can respectfully involve these people and not just you know asking a couple of people and then yeah and we really want to think about it but still we really also want yeah. to make this adjustment because there were re really a harmful language so okay. it's step by step yeah. Right, right. Okay, we're going to go into a little bit of a quick fire round because we've okay. probably got about five minutes left. So we're trying to the, try and get these questions in. So from Cliff is asking, uh, how, you're, how are you um, mitigating the presence of terminology that exists in historical text where the terms are important in order to convey the thinking of society and people in previous decades or centuries? Yeah, so again, I think... Um... So we are not erasing the the if I understand the question correctly. So we're not erasing the original uh, subject headings. Um, it's only that they are not visible for the for the user. So that means that for research purposes, it's still possible um, to look for these 
um, historical terms, and they will get the same results yeah. as when they would search for the for the newer term. Um, right. So there, so for the research process, nothing changes, and of course, they, the books, the we haven't changed the titles, of course. So also, when uh, these terms are in the titles, these uh, books will also come up. Yep. Super. So, that's fine. Uh, so the next question, what's the size of, size of your national working group and uh, have you determined who needs to be involved? Ah, yeah. So um, we um, so the we had a first meeting uh, organized in uh, last April and therefore 50 uh, colleagues uh, attended. So these were mostly uh, li subject librarians, metadata specialists and people from special collections. And then uh, let's say 15 of those um, of that meeting uh, signed up for the, the real national collaboration. But in the meantime, many other people already heard from this initiative and wanted to join. So yesterday we were with 20 people, but I think for now we are with 25 people. And the um, core will be, uh, will exist from representatives of the, uh, so the, yeah, the UKB library. So. Um, similar to the research libraries UK, so the, really the university libraries. But from the outset, we said we want to, if if people from the, from museums, archives, uh, heritage institutions want to join, um, that would be uh, amazing. Right. Yeah. So we're going to go through three questions in three minutes. So no okay. pressure. <laughs> so in regards to not erasing colonial history, uh, can you share how you would treat controversial materials in items such as novels, for example, with explicitly derogatory titles? Uh, yeah, for now, we um, don't have a, a disclaimer or, or a statement uh, on that uh, automatically. But I um, also think that, well, the um, subject headings um, are added by uh, librarians, um, catalogers, so people who work in the library. And so that is, you could say, that is a reflection of how uh, uh, library workers uh, viewed the, um, the subjects or um, uh, how they would classify them. Yeah. But the, the title of a work that was attributed by the author and that- yeah. So yeah. That, that would remain. Presumably. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that is. Yeah. We, we are not responsible for uh, yeah. the title. Changing literary work, right? That's fine. Yeah. Next question. You talked about practical interventions with the uh, cat forward slash class of print materials, so classification. Uh, have you developed any approaches looking at descriptions of online materials and e-resources where often the metadata might come from supplier discovery services, etc.? And particularly in in an era of generative AI, you know, with the inbuilt algorithmic biases that can exist, um, have you been looking at the electronic portfolio? Uh, no. Short but... answer. No. <laughs> no, that's yeah. fine. That's, that's okay. Well, thank you for that comment. No yeah. worry. That's a, that's a work in progress. And the final question: How realistic do you think the re reclassification is in view of the fact that non-fasted schemas, which traditionally changed slowly? Library of Congress, you know, Dewey, are so entrenched? Uh, yeah, that's a very big question. Um, so the so short answer would be if we are talking about our own um, um, like physical collection, I thought, so the problematic lo local classification systems I, um, I refer to, um, these are, we can um, make these into smaller projects. So we can, for example, first focus on the, the theology collection I mentioned as an example, and then first take on that one and just um, think about what uh, collections have priorities are the most uh, problematic and then focus first on, on those. 